Delta Lake is a key enabler of the lake house because it fixes the limitations of data lakes. On their own, data lakes have several challenges. First, it's really hard to get reliable, quality data because you're bringing together a huge variety of data sets. Second, it's hard to get great performance. If you have millions of tiny files to read, lakes just aren't built to do that really quickly. Third, you're operating at the file level. You can't deal with the contents of the files, so security is all or nothing. And if you want to have uh, sharing on subsets of the files or versions of the files, we have to make lots and lots and lots of copies, which makes governance really, really hard. Delta Lake provides the ability to build curated data lakes. So now you have reliability, performance, and governance that you expect from data warehouses directly on your data lake. You gain reliability with asset transactions. Now you can be sure that all the operations you do on your data lake either fully succeed or they are aborted and the residue is cleaned up. You can also time travel back and forth in your data sets, which is really important for governance and compliance. And we're able to enforce really strict schemas on your data so you can avoid having the data become a data swamp. Additionally, as data flows into the Delta Lake, we build indices. These indices help us actually do really, really fast queries on the data later on so that you can match the performance of data warehousing directly on your data lake. And finally, Delta Lake provides support for fine-grained access control. That's really important because you want that in that enterprise where you want to maybe hide some data sets and you want to lock them down and make sure that you're really secure. This project has come a really long way since its inception. In fact, the 1.0 release was just certified by the community. Now, to tell us more about this milestone, I'd like to welcome Michael Ambrust, Distinguished Engineer at Databricks, to the stage. Hey, Michael. Hey, Ali. Thanks. It's been a long journey to get to Delta Lake 1.0. Before we start there, I'd like to take a look back at where we've been and figure out how we got here. Delta Lake was first open sourced in April of 2019. And that first version was pretty exciting. It included ACID transactions and schema management, it included streaming and batch, but we didn't stop there. We quickly added support for DML commands and for vacuuming. We added Scala and Python APIs. We added improved compaction and concurrency. We made it possible to convert parquet tables into Delta using only SQL. Uh, we added uh, things like describe history, which allow you to understand how your table has been evolving over time. We added support for a whole bunch of different engines like Presta and Presto and Athena. And finally, we've really been working a lot on merge and other features uh, you know, as, as we approach the 0.8 release. Today, Delta is used all over the world. We process over an exabyte of data per day. It accounts for over 75% of the data that is scanned uh, amongst all of Databricks customers. And we have over 3,000 customers using it today in production. And that's why I'm really excited to announce Delta Lake 1.0 with a suite of new features that make it available everywhere. The first feature I want to talk about is generated columns. The problem that you're solving with generated columns is one that data engineers are very familiar with. You have a table that is, has a, a timestamp column in it, but you don't want to partition by timestamp. That would result in way too many partitions. So instead, you want to partition by date. So you could do this. You just add a column that takes that timestamp and converts it into a date. But you need to manually create that column. You need to tell all of your users that they need to manually add predicates to query both of these. Otherwise, they won't be able to take advantage of optimizations like partition pruning. And this is obviously error prone and costly if forgotten. It can change your query runtimes dramatically. And that's why I'm really excited to announce generated columns. This allows you to specify that you want the state column to all or whatever column you want to be generated to be automatically added. Delta understands the functional dependencies between these two columns. So if you write a predicate against the other, it can infer the predicate that should be added against the other one. And unlike other projects where this is kind of a physical concept that is limited to only partitioning, generated columns is based on standard SQL. And so you know, it's ready for your, for your lake house. Using it is pretty simple. All you need to do is add a little bit of extra uh, information in your, your DDL when you're creating your Delta table. So you can see here, I define an event date, and I just specify how to generate it. If the user specifies it, we'll confirm to make sure it's correct. And if they don't, we'll automatically fill it in with the correct value. I think this is going to be huge for performance and also ease of use for Delta. Another really exciting feature coming in Delta 1.0 is cloud independence. Now, what do I mean by that? 
Delta has always worked on a variety of storage systems. You could use it on Hadoop, you could use it on S3, you could use it on ADLS Gen 2. But with the advent of Delta 1.0 and the delegating log store, you can have a single cluster that reads and writes from different storage systems. This is pretty awesome because it means that you can do federated querying across your data stored in different clouds, or you can use this for cross-region consolidation, taking information from all of the different places you have it and bringing it into one, one place. And this, I think this is a, a pretty cool feature because we've also been expanding the set of file systems that is supported by Delta. So we recently added support for Google Cloud and also IBM Cloud. And if you don't see your favorite one on here, stay tuned towards the end where we'll tell you how to get involved. Another feature that Delta has always had was multi-table transactions. So the idea here is I have multiple clusters that are all writing to a single Delta table. And what you're gonna see is the Delta asset transaction protocol is able to mediate across all of these different clusters. So if two clusters try to update the same data at the same time, it will check to see if there's any conflicts. And if so, it'll abort one of them so they can retry later. This has worked on Hadoop, where we have transactional rename, and also on ADLS Gen 2, and Google Cloud. However, users of S3 have always been left in the dark. It turns out that S3 is missing the transactional primitives that we need to build this. And that's why I'm really excited to talk about a new initiative that's going on in open source, where a couple of different open source committers are adding the ability to use DynamoDB in the ACID transaction protocol to actually mediate between these different writers. So users from S3 can also write to a single table from multiple clusters. When Delta started, it was pretty much a Spark project. You know, I, we had really good integration with Spark, so you could use the streaming and batch APIs to read and write from Delta tables. And you know, I'm a little biased, I think Spark is pretty good, but it turns out that there's a bunch of different engines out there and a variety of reasons why you'd want to use them. And that's why another kind of key feature that we're releasing is the Delta standalone reader. So this is another implementation for the JVM that understands the Delta transaction protocol, but doesn't need a Spark cluster. It can read that transaction protocol directly. And this will make it significantly easier to build other engines on top of it. We already use this inside of the Hive connector and there's work on a Presto connector as well. And Delta is no longer limited to the JVM, there's also a Rust implementation. And one of the nice things about having native code for reading from a Delta Lake is this makes it easy to integrate with a variety of languages. So we also have support for Python, Ruby, Go, and also direct connect from Kafka all through these Rust findings. And I'll give some pointers later in the talk on how to find more of this. Now that we've got great Python support, it's important that it's easier for Python users to get started. There's two different packages, depending on how you're going to be using uh, Delta Lake from Python. If you want to use it along with Spark, you can pip install Delta Lake Spark, and it'll set up everything you need to run Spark jobs against your Delta Lake. If you're going to be working with smaller data, or you want to use Pandas or some other libraries, you don't need Spark to access Delta from Python anymore. You can just pip install Delta Lake. And this installs the native client for Delta based on the Rust bindings. And as you can see, with just a couple of lines of code, we can get started reading our Delta tables. Also, Delta now supports Spark 3.1. It's super important with the pace of uh, advances going on in the Spark community that Delta keeps up to date with them. And so we're really excited to announce that Spark uh, Delta Lake 1.0 works with Spark 3.1. This means you can take advantage of imp improved predicate pushdown and pruning available in Spark 3.1. Another place where we did some pretty deep integrations is with SQL compliance. So there's now ANSI standard uh, DML and DDL for doing insert, merge, and explain. And finally, we're also integrating with the catalog APIs in uh, Spark for doing structured streaming. So if you want to stream from Delta tables that are stored in your catalog, you can now do that without having to manually deal with the path yourself. So with the advent of all of these features, Delta is now available anywhere you could want to use it. It's available from a variety of languages, a variety of services. There's connectors for all of the, all, all of the popular tools for data engineers. And it's also queryable from many different databases. And as my friend Tyler said, you know, Delta Lake 1.0 is now ready for every workload. And this journey hasn't been easy, and it's involved a bunch of contributors from the open source community. That's why I'm also excited to announce that we'll be adding a bunch of new Delta Lake committers to the project. Uh, and these are coming from a couple of different companies. I'd like to highlight in particular Scripty and Backmarket, who have been adding a whole bunch of things in Rust and Kafka Connect and SQL Ingest. It's a really exciting time in the Delta community. 
I'd encourage you to also get involved if you haven't already. Uh, there's a bunch of different channels to get involved with Delta. You can check us out on Slack or on the YouTube channel where you can find this video and other videos. There's a pretty active user group if you want to ask questions. And if you want to get involved with the actual code, I encourage you to join us on GitHub or also join the weekly Delta Rust meetings where they're talking about how that part of the project is going to involve. Finally, I'd like to plug a, a book from my good friends, Denny, TD, and Vinny. Uh, this is the authoritative source on how to use Delta Lake. Uh, so check this out if you want to learn more. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time.